One of the earliest agricultural societies that appears in the American Southwest are known as the Hohokam, Although much debate still occurs amongst scholars about their early origins and migration patterns, it is our belief the Hohokam were in fact migrants from Mesoamerica. When analyzing their material technologies, distinct traits and iconography from Mesoamerica appears. These items and cultural practices include the use of scarlet macaws, iron pyrite mirrors, shell jewelry that is identical to styles found in ancient Mexico, ball courts, platform mounds, copper bells, incense audios, rubber and stone balls, turquoise mosaics, effigy pallets, and much more. The Hohokam territory throughout time and space was a large eco-space of land reaching from present-day Phoenix stretching out to the northern tip of Nogales, Mexico. Our modern culture looks at this desert landscape and often questions how ancient civilization could have thrived in such an arid environment. While challenges most certainly did exist, we can definitively say that Hohokam inhabitants mastered their landscape by building a monumental civilization with the most elaborate irrigation and canal systems in North America. After many years of working and piecing together a complex puzzle, archaeology has created a timeline for Hohokam civilization. While excavations at large sites such as Snake Town and Pueblo Grande assist with the Hohokam timeline, observing diagnostic patterns and ceramic sequences plays a pivotal role as well. The Hohokam millennium is split up into two sequences of time known as the pre-classic and classic periods. Within each period, more definitive phases exist where we see shifts in decorated ceramics, cultural practices, and to some degree, later religious ideology. Around 8050 to 300, we see the first distinctive traits of Hohokam civilization appear in the archaeological record. During this time, the production of redware ceramics and shell begins to increase while irrigation systems continue to expand. By 700, the Snake Town phase begins where low platform mounds, red on buff pottery, and cremation burials were common cultural practices. From 750 to 900, artistic complexity and Hohokam civilization flourishes. An increase of Mesoamerican traits become common during this time where ideas from southern groups become widely accepted amongst Hohokam people. Exotic goods are imported, elaborate life forms are painted on red on buff ceramics, elaborate motifs are carved into shell and stone palettes, and the use of ball courts brings people together. When examining projectile points during the Gila Butte and Santa Cruz phases, it becomes widely apparent these were the most complex series made in North America. From 900 to 1150 in the Sacaton and Santan phases, open marketplaces became popular while keeping cultural influences and ideas alive and well. The mass production and wide distribution of red on buff ceramics hit its apex. While life forms were still common, geometric patterns became highly desired in the Hohokam heartland. Around 1125, inhumation burial practices were conducted and the site of Snake Town became abandoned. As time progresses into the classic period, we see a major shift amongst the Hohokam. By 1175, ball courts and open marketplaces declined. At the same time, above ground walled compounds and massive platform mounds make an appearance. These structures were likely controlled by an elite group of people. Interestingly, shell jewelry remains complex as red on buff pottery declines. From 1200 to 1300, ball courts were completely abandoned and migrants flooded into the Hohokam world. Surely resistance likely occurred upon initial arrival. However, as the Salado religious belief system expanded, Hohokam people began to embrace its worldview. Indeed, Salado polychrome vessels became popular. By 1350, populations began to rapidly decline, and by 1450, cultural collapse occurred. Some theories on the abandonment of the Hohokam world include overpopulation, warfare, elites gaining too much power, disease, environmental stress, or even a combination of each. And while cultural collapse did certainly occur, it's important to understand that Hohokam society and civilization didn't vanish and disappear. Rather, the likely outcome was a mass migration into northern parts of Mexico, which some do certainly theorize. It's also important to point out that not all Hohokam people decided to leave and abandon the present-day Phoenix Valley. 
Certainly, cultural groups decided to stay, resorting to more mobile ways of life, thus becoming Odom, Hohokam descendant communities. In this video, I want to take you step by step in one of the most important cultural practices amongst the Hohokam people, and that is the crafting of the glycimerous shell bracelet. First, let's take a look at an original example. Here are two shell bracelets that I'm working with at the local museum, part of a massive collection of prehistoric perishable and non-perishable items. And unfortunately, all the items across this tablecloth are severely lacking context. So the only thing that I'm left with is a book of notes. This is the, Joy, the J. Lloyd Ewart collection from 1958 to 1966. This is the notebook, primarily consisting of field notes, very rough and rudimentary. When I go inside of the book, for example, this says December 13th, one good point, very long, a broken shell ornament, possibly bird pendant, site number 15, and site number 15 is adjacent to John's ranch. So whoever John is, I cannot tell you. And that brings me to the discussion of archeological preservation and why it's so important. So it's important to leave these items exactly where they rest. So future archeologists such as myself, if there's ever development and construction at these locations, we know exactly what is there. We can do further investigations and understand these prehistoric cultures and civilizations much more than we do at current moment. So, um, very nice examples, but definitely missing the context. Uh, this collection has thousands and thousands of items. As we take a look at these two bracelets, you can see we have two different styles, but both are very common within the Hohokam cultural sphere. This bracelet is quite remarkable. It is a full shell bracelet. It does not exhibit any cracking or breaking. You can see this top half portion still exhibits a beautiful polish after all these years. And then towards the top, it is drilled completely through. The underside exhibits a bit of wormholing and pitting. That would be natural to the raw shell itself. And then the craftsperson decided to continue crafting it into this beautiful example. This probably, if I were to guess, fits a woman's size wrist. And then the smaller shell bracelet, you can see, once again, very different style to this full shell bracelet. It's cracked into three different fragments, but very common pattern throughout the Hohokam cultural sphere. If I were to guess, probably an infant's bracelet, maybe part of a necklace adornment. Now let's take a look at the raw shells themselves. Okay, so before I start crafting the shell into a bracelet, I want to provide further context within the shell species. So as you can see here, I have a completed Hohokam replica bracelet that I made from the glycimer shell about a year ago. I have it nice and thin, hollowed out in the center, drilled at the tip all the way through on both sides. And make no question about it, making a shell bracelet like this that fits a man's wrist is a heavy task. It is a lot of work from start to finish. And that's because of the density of the shell. Unlike argillite, which is a softer, more clay-like stone, or even other shell species such as olivella, um, a thinner, more fragile shell, this is a very thick, uh, dense shell. So it takes a lot of time and perseverance to get through a bracelet. It's not something you start on day one and end on day two. It takes me, relatively speaking, about five to six days from start to finish. But the end result, as you can see, is a beautiful replicated Hohokam style shell bracelet. Now on the sandstone slab, you can see we have various raw glycimer shells and I want to cover each one individually. Starting up top with this adult species, you can see it's a large shell, quite thick, beautiful round shape that will fit a male size wrist. So this will fit a larger wrist. This is what we'll be crafting our bracelet from. There's a couple flaws which are common within these older adult species. You can see a little bit of deterioration along the edge and then wormholing along the sides. We should be able to get underneath those. Time will tell as this process goes along in crafting, but definitely the adult example is going to be the largest shell. Now, right below that, we have a younger immature example, same species, of course, Glycimerus gigantea. And 
we notice that there's some stark differences, specifically within the coloration. We have a beautiful color. Um, this was recently gathered, so we don't have any worm holing and free of any deterioration along the edge of the shell. This will make a really nice woman's size bracelet. So the question becomes, where did the raw shell come from and how was it obtained? Simply put through trade. The Hohokam would travel into West Mexico along the shores and trade with local inhabitants, bringing the raw materials back up into the American Southwest and the Hohokam heartland. From there, they were crafted at specialty sites by specialists, very skilled specialists. As time goes along into the classic period, the Hohokam created very elaborate and exquisite pieces, often displaying motifs that we have a hard time replicating even with modern tools to this day. From there, the Hohokam would then trade the completed and sometimes raw items throughout the Southwest to neighboring groups and villages. All right, now the work begins. You can see I have a large sandstone slab. I'll be utilizing this entire surface to grind the shell top. So the shell top is quite thick as we mentioned. And if this starts to dull, I'll either repeck the surface or I'll just add fine grit sand and create a sand slurry. So we'll get at it. We're going to use lots of water, warm water, during these colder winter months. And that should keep the dust at bay. Well, as I was working the shell, you can see what I ran into. This worm pitting is much worse than anticipated. It actually runs right to the bottom of the shell. So I'm just going to discard it and start with a fresh shell. We'll start the process all over again and I'll start removing this top. Here you can see I removed quite a bit of material on the top of the shell. I have a nice wide opening. At this point I'm going to flip it over and start working on this underside. Get rid of some of these humps and bumps, these valleys, and get this bridge even with the beak of the shell. So I'll start grinding on the sandstone slab on this underside. So the bottom of the shell is really looking nice. I got rid of those valleys, those humps and bumps. And as I stare down right in the center, I see that both sides are even. One side isn't elevated compared to the other. And that goes without saying, picking a flat sandstone slab surely is important within this process of recreating a Hohokam style shell bracelet. So moving forward, I'm going to start working on this top side once again. And as I point the shell bracelet or the shell right up to the sunlight, I can see that these edges are semi-translucent. And what that means is we have a thin area around this circumference. So I can get in here and I can save a little bit of time by pecking out this interior. After I peck it out, I can then grind it once again on the sandstone slab, repeat that same process of pecking and then grinding. Once again, it just saves a little bit of time. So the tools that I use, I use a bone hairpin. You can use a bone awl or an antler tine will work just fine. And then of course, a very lightweight hammer stone. So we'll start that process right now and continue crafting this bracelet. So now I'm on day two of crafting the shell bracelet. Everything's looking really good and I'm liking what I'm seeing with this bracelet. I got a nice even shape and relatively speaking, I got much of the heavy work done. 
So at this point, I'm going to slow down this process and I'm at the step where I'm just going to refine this bracelet into the shape and size that's desired. So years ago, archeology span discovered a Hohokam village called Shelltown. And Shelltown is quite astonishing in the grand scheme of Hohokam lifestyle and traditions. Um, recently, that site has been thoroughly excavated and multiple reports have been published. So at Shelltown, they found that this was truly a specialty site where specialists would grind lots and lots of shell. They would create disc beads, pendants, rings, tubes, bracelets, so forth and so on, and then eventually traded them throughout the American Southwest into neighboring villages. So at Shelltown, they found sandstone reamers, and how they use these is they would take bracelets, they would insert the bracelet on top of the reamer, and they would work it in a circular manner to shape the inside into a nice, even round shape. And that's exactly what I'm going to do with the reamer that I created. So years ago, I made this reamer, and I'm going to crush sandstone and impregnate it on the top of this reamer around the circumference and start working this bracelet around until I get that round interior shape. After a few hours of shaping the interior of the bracelet, the final touches are made by thinning the high spots and rounding any sharp edges. Both large and small size bracelets recovered in the archaeological record display a drill hole towards the tip. Smaller examples were likely worn as necklace pieces, whereas larger bracelets might have had additional adornments such as feathers or turquoise fastened to the piece. Following in the footsteps of Hohokam craftspeople, I decided to drill a smaller size hole using multiple stone drill bits. Here is the bracelet complete. You can see I have a nice thin profile. The drill hole up towards the top was a success. Beautiful Hohokam design. Everything turned out very nice. This is a strong shell. It will last generations to come, fitting a woman's sized wrist. Now that first shell, you can obviously see I ran into some major issues, specifically with the pitting and wormholing, but I gotta tell you, it drove me up the wall. I was determined to start it and end up finishing it, no matter where the bracelet took me, whether it broke or not. That's exactly what this bracelet is. So this is the completed bracelet. I went ahead and finished it out off camera. The integrity of the bracelet isn't quite there. It's not going to be as strong. You can see the worm pitting is pretty heavy along this left side. It runs completely through on the underside, but the shell is still strong enough to withstand multiple drill bits towards that beak and the top. So it turned out pretty nice. I'm pleased with the results. Of course, this is a larger size bracelet. It will fit a male's wrist quite easily. You can see that here just slips on and off with no problem. This shell will last my lifetime, my kid's lifetime. Once again, I'm happy with both bracelets.